Good afternoon. Uh, it's my privilege to participate in the Rhinology Worldwide Video Textbook. Uh, and I thank Drs. Gudis Lee and David Kennedy for allowing me to participate. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Sharai Patel, who, who helped me put together this lecture uh, for uh, hopefully your, your understanding and for your pleasure. I do not have anything to disclose in this regard. So the outline for today is as you see, uh, and we will be copy, uh, covering many topics uh, dealing with complications and uh, endoscopic sinus surgery. Um, some background is that uh, I took the second course in the United States given by Heinz Stamberger in 1985 at the University of Chicago. And at that course, uh, everybody who participated was totally mesmerized because it was the first time that people were able to see endoscopically via video the nose and sinuses, as well as uh, a new uh, uh, understanding uh, for most of the people in the room of what the anatomy was like, uh, the pathology, as well as the use of the endoscope uh, to perform surgery. Uh, previously to 1985 and the introduction by David Kennedy of the United States and endoscopic sinus diagnosis and surgery, most surgery in the United States were external sinus uh, procedures done for complications of acute and chronic uh, sinusitis period. Uh, some of our colleagues were doing intranasal polypectomies and sinus surgery, uh, and uh, but the, most of the physicians uh, out there were not uh, doing this uh, period. So the introduction of endoscopic uh, diagnosis and surgery was a revolution uh, to the field of oral head and neck surgery. Uh, in truth, people were so taken by what they experienced that day that after the cadaver lab, the participants went ahead and uh, bought all the instruments that Carl Stortz had there to take home and start doing surgery. And this enthusiasm was just not for this course, every course that was given in the future uh, in endoscopic sinus surgery at that time uh, was appreciated in the same way. Unfortunately, at that course, there was not much talk about complications that could occur with the surgery. Uh, and so a lot of us went ahead and started doing endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, uh, and uh, lo and behold, uh, people were getting complications. Uh, and it was pretty problematic, period. Just at the outset of it, there was a case in Texas where a wife of a physician had endoscopic sinus surgery and was blinded in both eyes. Uh, even though the nurses told the physician that the eyes were moving while he was in the nose, uh, this was uh, this unfortunate complication occurred, and uh, this was something that a lot of people didn't expect, and uh, kind of opened everybody's eyes to the possibilities of what can happen with endoscopic sinus surgery. In 1987, I published the first paper dealing with specifically with complications of endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, which uh, were extraordinarily high. Uh, and uh, two years later, I published a follow-up paper in 1989, where with experience and achieving a learning curve, the complication rate uh, uh, diminished uh, greatly. However, these statistics here are from a paper with five experienced endoscopic sinus surgeries, including myself, Wolfgang Droff, uh, uh, Dale, uh, 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 Steve Shaver, Dale Rice, and, uh, and uh, uh, I believe Fred Kuhn. Uh, anyway, showing what the learning curve was for them with CSF leaks and periorbital violation. Uh, the note was that after you've achieved several surgeries, 100 to 300 CSF leaks uh, diminished. Uh, and periorbital violation likewise uh, did uh, with uh, the learning curve. And especially for our young colleagues, this is something they have to understand uh, that can happen. However, having said this, the complications can happen at any time through the lifetime of your sinus surgery 
experience. This is my paper after 25 years that I published on 105 complications, showing that uh, the most common complications were hemorrhage, uh, CSF leak, and orbital hematoma. However, as you look through, there's some other rare things that can happen uh, with this surgery and, uh, and uh, can become problematic. The key thing to mention about this is that, for instance, CSF leaks. I had a, my most recent CSF leak was a year ago. Uh, so no matter what your experience is, uh, especially with doing difficult endoscopic sinus surgery with a computer, with a computer or not, uh, you still are at risk for CSF leaks, uh, hemorrhage, and orbital hematoma. And especially with what we're doing with skull-based surgery uh, today, uh, these are things that have to be uh, looked at and understand that at any time, one of these complications uh, can occur. This is a paper uh, out of the University of Colorado uh, and uh, with other associated uh, authors, Peter Wang and Richard Orlandi, uh, showing that basically, uh, even with the use of image guidance, uh, complications uh, still can occur, uh, CSF leaks, orbital injury, and hemorrhage, and especially with the advent of image guidance and the increased difficulties of the surgeries that were being done, modified Lothrop's, uh, skull-based sphenoid surgeries, tumors, uh, uh, cephalocele's, uh, the, uh, the use of the computer uh, doesn't necessarily prevent you from having uh, a complication and you have to use your vision, uh, your preparation, uh, your knowledge of anatomy, uh, the use of the computer, uh, all of these things to avoid getting into complications despite whether you use a computer or not. Let's start with orbital injuries, uh, orbital fat, uh, there has not been a paper published on orbital fat uh, uh, in the literature, uh, except for this one, which was published a couple of years ago by me and other authors. Uh, and uh, in a survey of the American Rhinological Society, 93% of the surgeons said that they had encountered orbital fat. 88 identified fat using the bulb press test, uh, which uh, I... Uh, defined way back in the early days in the 1987 paper by looking simultaneously at the ethmoid and pressing the eye to see if there was any damage uh, to the lamina papyrecia. Uh, there were 25 patients who reported uh, major complications, vision loss and hematoma. In my experience over the years, there have been at least 140 orbital fat exposures uh, that, uh, that were noted. Uh, and uh, the big thing is, what do you do with orbital fat exposure? Uh, certainly, if there is bleeding, uh, you can consider cautery and preferably bipolar. Because uh, remember, if there is takedown of the lamina papyrecia, especially near the basal lamella, the medial rectus muscle sits right there. And uh, it can be in jeopardy, especially if you use unipolar cautery. Uh, you don't need to repair the dehiscence, leave it alone, go on with surgery, but uh, stay away from that area, especially the microdebreeder. Uh, the microdebreeder can get into that fat, get into the orbit in a few seconds, and uh, it has to be used with great care around exposed uh, orbital fat and a lamina dehiscence. Patients should be observed in the operating room, recovery room, and at home for hematoma or for hematoma or subcutaneous uh, emphysema. And of interest in future revision surgery, which I have performed on patients who have had orbital fat exposure, the risk of getting orbital fat exposure, again, is not so high because of the scarring uh, that occurs, uh, making it more difficult to, to re-enter into the orbit. Nevertheless, uh, heightened uh, uh, observation needs to be done. In this uh, case here, you see the bulb press test with the dehiscence uh, at the orbital fat uh, that is present. And it's important to note that uh, there's bleeding there, but it looks like fat. It's yellow and uh, uh, 
the slightest dehiscence uh, with orbital fat uh, uh, will show up. If we move onwards to diplopia, uh, uh, the most common thing that happens with diplopia is, is uh, featured by this slide. In most cases, it's related to the use of the microdebreeder. Uh, there is the hissence in the lamina papyrechia, which can be natural, it can be disease caused or physician caused. If the window of the microdebreeder, which is on high suction, is directed into that area, it can pull out orbital context, uh, contents, including the medial rectus muscle, into the ethmoid and damage uh, the medial rectus muscle, uh, as you see here. Uh, this is from one of my publications. Here you see a patient with some ecchymosis and uh, a medial rectus injury. Here you see on the right side where the lamina papyrechia has been taken down and the medial rectus as opposed to the left side has been traumatized and injured. This is a picture of a traumatized medial rectus muscle during endoscopic sinus surgery. And uh, the problem with this is that uh, unlike uh, pediatric eye muscle uh, issues, uh, with double vision, uh, which can be uh, repaired pretty easily and directly, these kind of transections or injuries are not easily repaired by ophthalmology. And uh, a lot of patients are left with permanent deficits as a result. This is a slide by David Kennedy. By David Kennedy. It's not his patient. This is a slide given to him showing basically liposuction uh, during endoscopic sinus surgery of the orbit. And this is kind of across the line type of thing because of the previous comments I showed you about the micro breeder pulling orbital tissue into the ethmoid sinus. Uh, that can be looked at as an inadvertent injury. And there's a defense to that injury where in this case, you're definitely in the orbit and, uh, and uh, certainly there's no real defense uh, uh, here. So you're, you can't miss that. And, uh, uh, thank you, David. Again, uh, referencing the, the, the uh, old press test. Um, this is a case where uh, endoscopic sinus surgery was done during a neurosurgical case. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the patient got bleeding into the orbit. You can see the eye swelling, the lid swelling, almost uh, some ischemia because of the pressures. In this circumstance, uh, a lateral canthotomy uh, was done and we'll show you the picture in a few minutes. But the big thing to understand about orbital hematoma is that there are two faces to it. There's a fast arterial anterior ethmoid artery uh, injury, and then there's a slow venous violation of the lamina papyrechia uh, with uh, uh, orbital fat lamina papyrechia injury. The arterial hematoma is due to that anterior ethmoid artery, which sometimes is in a sling at the skull base, and it's uh, amputated right near the orbit and pulls into the orbit. Therefore, you have an artery under high pressure pumping blood into the orbit, and it's rapid onset. Remember the orbit is an enclosed space, so it does not take a lot of blood in the orbit to rapidly increase normal pressures from 25 up to 50, 60, 70. Uh, about five cc's of blood or more in the orbit uh, can do this. This requires immediate treatment uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, if you cannot get the, uh, the uh, pressures down, then there's consideration for optic nerve decompression uh, within 15, 30 minutes, or blindness will occur. Venous hematoma is a result of venous injury of the bleeders in the, in the orbit and orbital fat. This is something that can occur from on to an onset of hours to days. 
Uh, it gradually increases the intraorbital pressure and proptosis, uh, but high pressures can obtain. This is typically a patient who's in recovery room and may have a little bit of ecchymosis, but goes home uh, and all of a sudden the eyelid is swollen uh, and uh, their lid is swollen and there's a problem with vision. Uh, the treatment is dependent upon extent. Most of these can be reversed and watched. However, uh, uh, you have a little bit more time to decompress if you need to, uh, but the patients have to be told uh, basically about the possibility of increasing blood in the orbit with vision and that they need to come in immediately if they're released from the operating room uh, with just some lid swelling. Certainly, if they have a venous hematoma, that has to be taken uh, care of in the operating room uh, prior to a patient going home. First thing to do with both of these, especially the fast bleed, uh, here you see a representation of blood in the orbit uh, during endoscopic sinus surgery. And uh, using palpation and orbital massage to redistribute the blood you can bring the pressures down and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, dramatically reduce uh, the chances of there being uh, optic nerve decompression due to blood built up in the orbit. Now, having said that with this, if you have an anterior ethmoid artery injury that pulls back, that necessarily may not tamponade with this. And uh, consideration for an external uh, uh, artery, anterior ethmoid artery ligation should be considered. Uh, people have tried to decompress the anterior ethmoid artery in the ethmoid endoscopically, uh, but have found it very difficult to do uh, and much more problematic. So this is something that needs to be considered in the treatments that you're going to do. And obviously this is the bulb press test again uh, to find any dehiscence uh, as far as treatment. The treatment available is lateral, lateral canthotomy uh, and uh, external ethmoidectomy, endoscopic orbital decompression and ligation of the anterior ethmoid artery, depending on how things uh, uh, can go. The lateral canthotomy can be done uh, with uh, a further extended canthotomy down to the ligament, which gives a lot of room. And uh, basically, uh, here you see the canthotomy, which is just simply a clamp and cutting and then cut down to the, the uh, tendon. Uh, and here you see that gentleman who had the massive orbital hematoma, which was, who was treated with the canthotomy and how good he looks after the surgery. Certainly in this case, we talked about the damage that could be done here and, and uh, with vision and everything else. Probably the most notorious uh, case study that uh, was reported is this one from Chang and Grant. Uh, which basically showed that someone during endoscopic sinus surgery, if you look over here on the left, had basically performed an endoscopic enucle enucleation of the eye. And uh, trust me, with a microdebreeder, you can get through the eye tissue and orbital tissue very quickly, probably in less than a minute. Uh, so hopefully this, this doesn't happen to anybody. This is a rare uh, a case report for, uh, complication, uh, but it's mentioned as far as possibilities of what can happen. As far as epiphora is concerned, uh, a lot of people don't realize that the ethmoid sinuses come right over the, lac the lacrimal sac and duct as you move anteriorly. Uh, there was a paper done uh, by Bill Bolger and Fred Kuhn uh, 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 way back uh, in the uh, later 80s uh, with complications with uh, uh, nasal lacrimal duct injury. And uh, what they did is that they did surgeries and then they went back and looked at a bunch of patients and put fluorescein in and found that 25% of patients who had had ethmoidectomies and max retrostomies uh, had uh, an injury to the nasal lacrimal duct. 
Now, the reason for that at that time was when the natural osteo was open, it was open forward with backward biting forceps, uh, oftentimes onto the maxillary line where this would be transected. Nowadays, we take the uncinate process off first, and then the maxillary entrostomy is open posteriorly, not with backward biting forceps, but with the micro debris or punch forceps, avoiding injuries to this. So this injury is a lot less reported than it was. Salvation uh, was in hand, however, and Ralph Metzen from Harvard uh, published the first paper in the literature on an endoscopic approach to uh, dacrocystorhinostomy, uh, and this revolutionized the treatment of this complication, and as well as uh, nasal lacrimal duct injuries for any reason. And uh, working with ophthalmology, uh, this is now the standard uh, for the most part of repair of any issues with nasal lacrimal sac uh, and uh, duct. And uh, using this light pipe, basically you look at the nose and a sign comes up and says cut here endoscopically and you can use your flaps and then working with ophthalmology, put a stent in uh, and, uh, and uh, the results here are in the upper 90s or mid 90s uh, of success and certainly are equivalent to any external procedure that's been done. Picture the light pipe going in and then endoscopically opening up the uh, duct. Subcutaneous emphysema can occur. You see a patient who has uh, bruising in the lower lid. Typically, it is the lower lid. Uh, any opening in the lamina papyrecia can contribute to subcutaneous emphysema. It doesn't have to be that orbital fat is apparent. And certainly in this circumstance, uh, if a patient uh, is bagged uh, as they awaken from anesthesia, or vomiting or whatever, uh, air can be forced into the eye. And here you see what she looks like afterwards. It just went away on its own. Uh, as long as there's no vision loss, this clears up. But this is another rare case uh, where a, uh, during endoscopic sinus surgery, an opening was made. And with uh, using an AMBU bag and other sort of measures, a patient actually had subcutaneous emphysema extend all the way down over the chest cavity and laterally uh, over, the, uh, over the chest cavity. Uh, this patient was observed and uh, did well, but certainly this is something that is kind of unnerving uh, and shows you uh, some of the strange things can happen during endoscopic sinus surgery. Moving on to CSF leak and pneumocephalus. Uh, here you see a patient uh, who has a left defect occurring during endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, this patient uh, postoperatively was noted, uh, and this was a dye, uh, fecal, intrathecal dye test that was done showing the leakage uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the ethmoid. Here you see the floor scene, uh, you see brain dura here, and you see the opening that was made into uh, the dura and into the sinus. And uh, the nice thing about this uh, is that, uh, first of all, with any of these complications, recognizing immediately what's going on, especially if it's orbit or bleeding or CSF, uh, it makes a huge difference as far as management and uh, avoiding the patient having uh, major complications and debilitation. Uh, so the easiest thing to do is get autologous tissue, which is right there. Uh, if it's a large defect, uh, you can use uh, cartilage or bone grafts uh, in order to bridge the defect. Alloderm is used commonly uh, by many of our sinus surgery colleagues. Uh, the, uh, the neurosurgeons prefer uh, Dura uh, uh, to, uh, to do this uh, uh, repair. We use fibrin glue. Uh, early on, there was a discussion about whether you should tuck the graft intracranially or just lay over. Pretty much an intracranial tucking is not necessary and a layover works great. The best way to do this is to do mucosal debridement first, 
uh, scarring up the area for receipt of the graft, put fiber and glue down, then your graft and fiber and glue again, Dean Toriumi from the University of Illinois reported this many, many years ago uh, amongst an animal repairs of CSF leaks and found that this was the best way to do it. And you can use free mucosa, septal turbinate, inferior meatus, temporal as fascia, fascia lata, fat bone cartilage. You can do a septal rotation flap, uh, posterior septal artery rotation flap, dura, alloderm, all of these things can be used. And the nice thing about it is in many cases here, you see a graft in place, uh, the success is had within 90% plus of cases. The big thing is that we need to avoid uh, any injury to the, uh, to, the, to the brain. Here you see a case of mine where you have a CSF leak, two CSF leaks here and in the back here during endoscopic sinus surgery. And this is a very difficult anatomic case, even with a computer. And unfortunately uh, you see this and uh, this was repaired uh, but uh, these things can happen. The big thing is to notice and to see uh, uh, what you can do to repair and avoid any further uh, uh, complications. This is a, a sad case. This is a 35 mother of 35 year old mother of two who underwent, underwent endoscopic sinus surgery. Here you see that she has an extremely low-lying skull base. These are things you need to look for prior to surgery. Normally the skull base is up here and uh, the Karos classifications that are in the literature uh, uh, are something that need to be considered. These also can be asymmetrical where one side can be high and the other low. But here you see that basically the skull base goes through the middle of the orbit and here you see that both sides of the skull base was entered with trauma to the frontal lobe and to the brain uh, with major hemorrhage. And fortunately, uh, this lady did not survive. So uh, these are not things to be taken lightly, especially with what we're doing with skull base surgery. And you always have to be on your game and observing and be careful about what's going on. And in this circumstance, you need to have the CTs in the, in the operating room with your image guidance if you have it and using your knowledge to stay out of trouble. Something that also is not often talked about regarding the surgery that we do is anosmia. Uh, certainly we all are aware of patients who have nasal polyps uh, and the fact that they have smell loss especially in those cases where you have done revision surgeries. Uh, certainly the more surgeries you do for polyps, the less uh, is the ability for you to get smell back uh, after these surgeries. Any revision surgery you do at the skull base area and up near the cribriform plate runs a risk of smell loss. Removal of the middle turbinate or superior turbinate was a, was a consideration years ago. But uh, 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 Don Leopold, uh, formerly chair at Nebraska and, and, at, Ver and at Vermont uh, ENT, uh, did some studies looking at this and found that, uh, that the really, even though there are some fibers that come down onto the middle term and superior turbinate, not enough uh, uh, are present. To, uh, to cause anosmia in the vast majority of cases. In fact, in the sphenoid, a lot of us will remove the lower half of the superior turbinate in order to gain access to the sphenoid. And this rarely, if ever, causes any issues with smell loss. Certainly the modified Lothrop is right there. Uh, you are, are uh, doing medial and lateral openings into the frontal right above the cribriform plate. Most of these people have extensive disease. And uh, these are things that you need to watch for and, and be concerned about. The important thing was that any of these cases is that before any surgery is performed, their smell needs to be tested uh, so that patients can be informed about what the circumstances are. And, uh, and as well as uh, postoperatively, if there's any uh, diminishing uh, of smell. 
and uh, or even with a septoplasty, it's important to record what patients smell are. Uh, smell is, uh, unfortunately, some people have reported uh, smell loss during septoplasty. So this is something that uh, you need to know. Certainly now with, uh, with uh, uh, smell exercise and, and treatments, uh, a lot of this is improving. Uh, in smell, uh, especially in COVID patients, as we all know. Uh, but, and also with the introduction of the biologics like Dupixent, uh, a lot of folks, even though they've had multiple surgeries, uh, have had uh, better control of their polyps and many of them have gotten smell back. So there is an answer today, which wasn't present years ago. Uh, and these are things that need to be considered. Lastly, moving on to vascular injury, uh, obviously the, the, the slide speaks for itself. The most common area, especially if you look back to my complications for bleeding is from the spinopalatine artery. Uh, as it crosses over to the septum, this artery also feeds the inferior turbinate uh, and the middle turbinate and mechanisms of, of bleeding occur when this artery is traumatized. For instance, if you're going through the basal lamella and you cut down too low on the basal lamella because that's where the vessels bridge across to the middle turbinate, you can get a delayed hemorrhage uh, 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 from these patients. And a lot of people don't consider that, but it, trust me, it can occur. When you go into the sphenoid, you have vessels from this branch which come up medially and laterally. So it's not uncommon when you open this area to see bleeding occur either right or left. A lot of times it scares the heck out of you because you think it's the carotid, but uh, in, indeed uh, it is the branch from the sphenol, uh, sphenopalatine vessels. The posterior ethmoid artery is in most cases encased in bone and uh, it's not really been reported as being problematic uh, uh, as opposed to the anterior ethmoid as uh, we have uh, mentioned. Here you see in this video, there's the typically going into the sphenoid and you see the bleeder occurring, uh, which is cauterized. Here you see going into the carotid artery during endoscopic sinus surgery. This is from the internet. And this is control of the bleeding, uh, actually the actual bleeding, which is controlled endoscopy wise at the time of surgery. And here you see the control. Surgicel is put into place to tamponade it. Uh, and uh, along with some clipping and, uh, and uh, also consideration for angiogram and possible em embolism uh, of that vessel if there's, if there's all uh, any worry or difficulty with this uh, the packing in place. Can be vigorous. So you see, they can actually clamp it. And now a surgical will be put in a place. There you go. And then this is packed over and then consideration for further therapies is something that has to be done. 
This is a patient of mine. Uh, I was going to do endoscopic sinus surgery for that right frontal and also for this phenoid sinus disease because of headaches. Uh, the interesting thing about this case is that he had um, had previous surgery elsewhere about six weeks or so before coming to see me. And uh, at that surgery, which was an ethmoidectomy uh, uh, and uh, opening into the sphenoid, there was no major bleeding. However, he took an airplane flight about six to eight weeks after the surgery and had a major bleed uh, in the, on the plane. He came to see me with, uh, with uh, these findings. And uh, here you see on these axial views, uh, uh, disease coming up right to the opening of the sinus. Here you see some thickening back here. And if you trace the thickening back here, you see it leads right to the carotid artery with a, a uh, aneurysm uh, coming forward. Well, unfortunately, uh, I didn't recognize that. I thought that this was uh, uh, just a chronic sinusitis. And so here you see a depiction of what I saw when we took the anterior wall down. I did not enter posteriorly, but this was grasped. And obviously relating back to that picture that I showed you or that video of the bleeding, all of a sudden blood was pouring out of the nose and I immediately recognized we had a, a, a carotid artery injury. Uh, this is kind of a gross picture of, of what had to happen immediately. He had had a throat pack put into place pre, uh, before surgery. Uh, he had uh, Foley catheters put into place along with packing. Uh, and uh, he was taken down to the uh, neurosurgical suite for endo endovascular embolization which is important because uh, it can avoid morbidity and mortality associated with a craniotomy. Uh, and uh, a lot of patients uh, uh, avoid neurological injury and, uh, and uh, the testing is done to make sure there's no problems with uh, cross circulation. Here you see the evidence of the aneurysm and the attempt to coil it, which was done uh, and done successfully. And uh, here you see the finished product. And fortunately, this patient woke up, had no neurological problems, uh, and uh, actually did very, very well. But uh, it's something to show you what can happen and become problematic. Post carotid, certainly you want to type and cross. Your neurosurgeons are involved, the arteriogram with possible embolization uh, and occlusion is something that is so important. And this is where your neurosurgical colleagues uh, are, are so helpful. If you look at litigated complications, the most common complications today are diplopia, mainly with the medial rectus. However, injury to the inferior or superior rectus muscles has occurred, the superior oblique combinations of the above. Uh, CSF leak uh, is something that also can be litigated, but uh, not as much as the diplopia. Uh, and blindness is something fortunately is not seen too often today, but uh, still is something that needs to be considered. Uh, and for nurses who are in the operating room with you uh, or in the clinic with you, understand that uh, problems can occur with medications they prescribe, uh, laboratory results, preoperative education and consent, medication, CTs in the OR, recovery, recovery room concerns, and also in the operating room, the use of medications uh, and making sure that 1% uh, xylocaine with epinephrine uh, is labeled so that you're not injecting that into the orbit uh, uh, inadvertently uh, or uh, if you're using some kind of a defog agent uh, that that's labeled, so that's not injected because in the past, these have been cause of orbital injuries and, and can be avoided. The key points for this lecture are that complications are inevitable. They're going to happen. They're going to happen to all of us. The whole idea is to identify the complication is happening and the, is the most important step to preventing uh, 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 
debilitation and permanent injury. Uh, you know, you have to have a gut feeling. Uh, and if you remember Yoda from Star Wars, you have to trust your feelings. Because the point of the matter is, if it doesn't look right, stop and look around and find out where you're at. Don't proceed. Uh, use your image guidance to check, make sure your image guide is calibrated properly. Uh, and uh, acting as fast as you can to recognize what's going on makes a huge difference. Always have a plan and be prepared. Postoperative hemorrhage, orbital injury, and CSF leak are the most common complications. Vision changes in CSF leak uh, with complications of brain injury are the most litigated. Be honest with patients and yourself about complications, patients' families, uh, get appropriate informed consent and have post-complications discussions. These are some suggested reading articles uh, for your uh, benefit and uh, other sources that have been used in this talk. I appreciate being able to talk with you about complications. Uh, and again, I thank uh, our editors and my co-author, Chirag Patel, and uh, have a good day.